The science of chemistry has disappointed many people. It upset the emperor of China in the year 59 BC. He had been told that one of his court officials, Liu Xiang, could make gold. A great feast was organized at the end of which Liu Xiang was to prepare a small quantity of the precious metal. After toiling away with complicated apparatus for several hours, all he succeeded in producing was an unpleasant smell. <laughs> Liu Xiang was executed on the spot. This true story reflects one of the problems which has confronted people since the beginning of time. The problem being an understanding of how substances turn into different substances. This issue of substances turning into different substances has today evolved into the grand science of chemistry. So what is chemistry? Chemistry is the science of substances and how they turn into different substances. And very frequently, you can recognize a chemical change because there is a change of color. As I'm pouring my chemical waters from one flask to another, you'll notice they're changing color. And the reason why they're changing color is because a new substance is being made every time. Chemistry plays an extremely important role in our everyday lives, as I'm sure you're all aware. Thanks to the science of chemistry, today we have purified drinking water from our taps. Thanks to the science of chemistry, today we have plastics, polymers, glues, adhesives, dye stuffs, we have paints, varnishes, we have cosmetics, we have cosmetic creams, toothpaste, dental materials, we have explosives, we have fuels, agricultural chemicals, an unbelievable range of products that we use on an everyday basis. We have soaps, shower gels, detergents, medicines, um, all sorts of creams, um, shampoos, Perfumes, a massive, massive chemical industry today makes our life on this planet very, very much, much pleasanter. It, it helps us enormously. Chemistry then, the science of substances and how they turn into different substances. And in these reactions here I've showed you, these short experiments, I have demonstrated for you some examples of chemical changes which we can represent by means of a color change. Now, I've shown you some chemical waters, but now I'm going to change to a type, different type of water. Here I have a type of water which the magicians call magic disappearing water. And the reason why is when you throw it in the air and stand under it, it disappears into thin air. And the reason why it disappears into thin air is because it represents one of the... It is, in fact, made of thin air itself. It is actually the um, liquid nitrogen, which is the main component of the air. And the preparation of liquid nitrogen uh, in 1883 is actually one of the greatest triumphs of the science of physics. And the reason why liquid nitrogen boils at room temperature is because it is unbelievably cold. Its boiling point is minus 196 degrees centigrade. And as it's so, in this room we have a temperature of 20 odd degrees centigrade, the liquid nitrogen continues to boil away. And you see the water vapor condensing coming away here. Now, one of the most important things that you must bear in mind when dealing with boiling liquids is you must never ever, um, the a liquid which is boiling undergoes a huge expansion in volume as it boils away. And you must never ever have a boiling liquid in a sealed vessel. Now, that's precisely what I'm going to show you what happens <laughs> in the next few minutes. I have now poured in a small quantity of liquid nitrogen into each of those three um, plastic bottles, themselves, of course, a splendid product of the uh, chemical uh, technology. I'm just topping them up a little bit. They, they need about 100 centimetres cubed each. And what's going to happen, I'm now going to very tightly put the lids on these, just, just approximately, I've got about 100 cc's, 100 centimetres cubed of, of each of those um, of li liquid nitrogen in each bottle. Now, the bottle is half uh, approximately 500 millilitres, and um, 
The, when the uh, liquid nitrogen boils, it expands by a factor of about 800. And therefore, <laughs> the, um, it will make a, a total of 800, 800, uh, 800 times 100, which is 80 litres, and that will generate a pressure of 160 atmospheres in these bottles. Now, these bottles, therefore, are not designed to withstand that kind of a pressure. <laughs> And therefore, there is a very strong chance that they will explode, and that's why I'm putting them in dustbins. Now, I do have to warn you, they, um, the bangs are very, very loud indeed, and people sitting, if you, uh, if you are, so, have a, dis, of a, of a nervous disposition, uh, I certainly am, but for other reasons, then... Um, <laughs> then um, then you are going to, um, uh, as I said, it takes about seven minutes, six or seven minutes. Now, I'm going to carry on, the show must carry on, and I'm going to show you a couple of other effects with liquid nitrogen, which, of course, are not that surprising. I'm going to pour some water in here and cover it with liquid nitrogen, and you will observe, obviously, the water will freeze. But this is a very interesting experiment uh, from the, in the dimension of physics. And the reason why is that we are actually demonstrating three states of matter in one beaker. I've mixed together two colourless liquids here, and unlike here where I mixed colourless liquids and I got a dramatic colour change, a new substance being made, that was an example of a chemical reaction. Here, what we're doing is under, there's a physical change taking place. The liquid nitrogen is boiling away to give gaseous nitrogen, and the liquid water is freezing to make solid water, otherwise known as ice, obviously. So we have the three states of matter in just one beaker, solid, liquid, and gas. So I will allow that to carry on boiling. In the meantime, um, cold temperatures, indeed temperatures, are associated with energy. The higher the temperature, the greater the energy state. We in this room have lots of energy because it's warm. And this rubber tubing is elastic. I can stretch it a few times like this, you see. And it's got lots of energy. I've got lots of energy. We've all got lots of energy. <laughs> However, if I now place this into a, a thermos flask full of liquid nitrogen, then you will observe a most interesting effect. And there you see a fountain of liquid nitrogen is coming out. Now, the reason why we can once again explain this in the domain of physics is because the liquid nitrogen is extremely cold, comes into contact with the rubber tube, which is relatively hot, and it boils inside. And as it boils, as I just explained to you, undergoes a coefficient of expansion of about 800, and therefore the liquid nitrogen is forced out in the rubber tube, the pressure builds up, and so it goes shooting out. But not only is that of interest, it's also what happens to the rubber tube. And you'll notice it's has acquired a completely different consistency. Now, the pressure is being taken up, and we may hear loud bangs, but I just wanted to show you and explain to you why has this suddenly become so rigid. And the answer is because there's very little energy. You see, at high temperatures, it's got lots of energy, but suddenly, when it gets cold, it just does this. <laughs> and not, it's very brittle, and we can demonstrate that for you by smashing it into a thousand pieces, you see. So that is just a demonstration of how absolutely dangerous um, the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the rubber becomes as when it gets to a very low temperature. Now, I'm going to move this off now and show you an experiment with a beautiful balloon which I have here. Now, for this purpose, I'm going to just move this over here, put a mat here, and I want to show you the effect of temperature. Now, by the way, do be warned, we may have a loud bang soon. Now, here we have, you see, a beautiful balloon floating in the air. Now, it's floating in the air because it's got um, air at a reasonable pressure inside here. Why does it have pressure? Because molecules of nitrogen and oxygen in the air are moving around with great rapidity, and as they strike the membrane, they have lots of energy, so they maintain a pressure. However, if we now pour liquid nitrogen over the balloon, then you hopefully will notice a change in the volume of the balloon. And as it gets very cold, so the air inside is colder, so the molecules have less energy. When they have less energy, they move around much more slowly. And then when they move around much more slowly, they exert a much lower pressure. And then you see a... <laughs> well, I see we're carrying on. And we're just carrying on. So you see the balloon has now collapsed. However, these changes are reversible. 
these changes are reversible, and as I throw up the balloon and allow it to warm up a little bit, then very slowly the balloon will be restored back to its former shape. Once again, demonstrating the reversibility of a physical process. Now, I've finished with this now, because I want to move on to my final topic, and that, of course, is fire. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, my favorite topic, shall I say. Now, the flame which you see here represents one of the greatest achievements of early human civilization. For it was about 150,000 years ago in East Africa, where our most ancient ancestors used to live, that people for the first time were able to produce a flame like this, either by striking flints or by twiddling sticks to generate friction, and, for and to sustain the flame. And for thousands of years, this was the only type of flame known to humanity. Until that is about 250 years, when and chemists made a most remarkable discovery. Now, I'm going to introduce you to this discovery, and I'll tell it to you it's in just four words. This is the discovery that chemists made 250 years ago, one of the greatest discoveries of all time. Air is a mixture. That's the discovery they made. That's one of the greatest discoveries. Why is that? Because in doing so, they identified two main components of air, which are gaseous and which look exactly the same to, um, to our eye and feel the same. They are, of course, nitrogen, which constitutes four-fifths of the air, and oxygen, which, con uh, which contributes to 20% of the air. Now, we can, it's very easy to remember. If you look at the fingers of one hand, four fingers represent nitrogen, one finger represents oxygen. When they discovered that, they said, brilliant, let's now make even better, brighter flames using pure oxygen, and so they did. And one of the ways was to combine, you could either combine a fuel with oxygen chemically, or you could mix the fuel with oxygen chemically. So I'm going to show you an example of both of these. I have here a piece of cotton wool, and this is in fact a substance which has been known. It was grown and cultivated by the great ancient civilizations in India uh, um, 5,000 years ago, and also the Mayan culture in Central America. They cultivated it because they were the first people who were able to make uh, threads and then they weave it into fibers and weave it into uh, rather the, the beautiful, beautiful fabrics. Now, what I wanted to tell you was cotton burn. No one ever dreamt of burning cotton. It was far too boring a flame. It was a waste of a wonderful material. However, I'm just demonstrating you how cotton burns, just to show you can see. And I wanted to explain to you that the reason why it's burning like this is because it's burning in air. And air only contains one-fifth oxygen, as I just mentioned. Now I'm going to show you a piece of... Um, these may go off or may not go off. It doesn't matter. We're, carrying on, and I just wanted to share a piece of cotton wool which has been chemically combined with oxygen. And you'll notice that this blow, this burns much, much better. Now, I have to make sure that my, um, my flame is, my uh, thing is, you must excuse me, I've got to double check that there is no glowing ember there. And I'm going to just show you a piece of uh, cotton burning. Uh, this is cotton which has been chemically combined with oxygen. Just see how much better it burns as a result of this combination with oxygen. And there you see an instantaneous combustion. Now that you see, that was um, an example. That was the, this commercially known as gun cotton. Its chemical name is nitrocellulose. And it was the world's first ever high explosive. Invented in 1846 by Professor Christian Schoenbein, professor of chemistry at the University of Basel. I will now show you a brief pyrotechnic effect using this cotton. I have a tiny little piece here. And I'm just going to, this is a mortar here, which is a standard, uh, standard repertoire of fireworks works, and I'm going to fire some ping pong balls. So here, just a tiny piece, we don't need very much at all, a tiny piece of our gun cotton in the cage there, and I'm going to drop it in, I'm just trying to look to see, ah, there we are, we're going to drop it in there like that, one, two, three, four, four, five, five ping pong balls, we have a small fuse, and we shall set it on fire. Please excuse me, I've just got, ah, got my fuse here, we'll set the fuse on fire, and hopefully you will see the five ping pong balls go into the air, if we're lucky, if we're lucky. And just excuse me, I'm just going to get my splint here, so we're going to now go um, put this on here, set this on fire, and I'm now 
Once this is aligned, hopefully we'll see the ping pong balls go into the air. I'm now turning to my very final experiments with these two balloons here. And there they are. They popped into the air, and you see all five balls came down. Nice. Now, here we have a balloon filled with the lightest gas in the universe. It is, of course, hydrogen. We've heard about that. That's been on the topic today. And I'm just going to show it burning. Pure, pure hydrogen is not used in children's balloons for the simple reason that it is um, it's very flammable. When it burns, it makes water, as we just Heard, and of course, no carbon dioxide. So there's pure hydrogen burning in air, and there it is. And then, just to show you now, I have here a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. This was called aria tonante, or thunder air, by the French philosopher Pirata de Rosi. This makes a very loud bang indeed, and therefore, I now apply my light there. There it goes. There it is. And for the finale, uh, for my finale now, for the final experiment, um, for my final experiment here, I have set up two balloons. I've made a fuse here. I've made a fuse here of about eight strips of my gun cotton. I shall set them on fire in the middle. Sorry, we've just kicked over a thermos flask of liquid nitrogen, but that only, that only adds to the fun. That only adds to the fun element. And now let's get my other balloon. And so I'm going to here. Here's my other balloon here. And we have a split. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to just summarize very quickly. So these are two balloons filled with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. They're going to make a very, very loud bang indeed. There will be a fuse burning across here, which is made of bits of strips of gum cotton. And... And I'll just summarize what I've been talking about. What, what have I been talking about to you? I've been talking about chemistry. What have I been selling to you? Chemistry. In short and simple language, chemistry for all. <laughs> and there it is. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Of Thank you very much. I bow humbly. Thank you very much indeed. They have gone off, that's better. Thank you, Herb. Sorry I ran over a bit, it was a bit manic. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> fourth, fourth time. Every time I say the same thing, look, I haven't discovered anything, I've made no new inventions, I have no new opinions on anything, I'm just a humble school chemistry teacher. He says, come back, we still want you. So I, I don't understand that. But thank you very much, sir. I bow humbly and I salute you. I salute you, sir. Uh, uh, I don't think we'll ever see artificial intelligence doing this. There is some, still, <laughs> still some hope for humanity. Still some hope for humanity, sir. All right. Well, if we ever find robot Andrew, we'll be sure we'll invite him. I'm really mostly afraid that these two other things are going to explode on me. No, they might, no I don't think they will. It doesn't matter. One, they, you don't always get them to explode. All right. Well, it matters to me if it explodes on me. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You can see why Andrew is such a health and safety nightmare for the venue. Uh, yeah, yeah, I spent six hours doing the, uh, the, the, the risk assessment for this. <laughs> but it was worth it. I hope you found it was worth it, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. These, these two still haven't gone off, so stay yeah. away, sir. Uh, okay. Stay I'll away, stay away. sir. <laughs> we, we never know. They're highly <laughs> unlikely. They leak sometimes, so we'll, I'll deal with those after we've finished. All right. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Thank That's you my so greatest much. honor, sir. Lovely to see you. Thanks and again. Thank you so much indeed for inviting me again. Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers, bye sir. bye.